Hi guys, welcome to podcast. Um, myself and Jim this week are joined by the one and only PJ Holden. Uh, let PJ introduce himself there. Talk a bit about himself. Who are you, PJ? Hello. Where are you from? Hello, I'm PJ Holden. I'm from Belfast. Uh, says city of never ending rain usually, uh, but at the moment too much sunshine. Uh, people will know me best from my work on Judge Dredd for 2008 AD. I draw a lot of war stories with Garth Ennis. Uh, I've drawn thousands of pages of comics and I've been a professional for about 20 years or so. And I've known Jim for, like I don't know, since I was about 18, 17, 16, I don't know. Long a long, long time. Enough, it's longer than that, yeah. Long, long enough. Long enough to know better. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I've, known, I've known Ray for a few years, although I... I I mean, I hesitate to say I taught Ray, but like you, you were you were at that um, uh, comics class that I did in Dublin for, yes. uh, for uh, yeah. when we did that for when it was a five or six week course or something. I can't remember. Uh, and um, but I, I, I'm astonished. I'm not astonished and very pleased with how much work you've produced since. And I like to think I had some small part, but there's no way I did. I mean, <laughs> there's no way I did at all. Well, actually, you're definitely um, inspiring. I, I That's the thing, oh. you know. Um, I learned a lot about what the artist goes through, which helped me dealing with artists. Um, there wasn't too much on the business side of things. I sort of learned that as I've gone along. But mm. um, the the I advise anyone who's starting in comics to do a comic course, even if you're just looking on YouTube and picking up a few things. But you should really go and talk to an artist, talk to someone that actually made comics. Uh, it's worth the while. It'll save you a fortune. That's my little spiel over. Um, <laughs> so how did it save you a fortune? I mean, surely it's just done nothing but cost you money. Well, when you start off, what happens is people who are sort of in the same boat, they tell you the rules as they know them. They may not have done what they say they've done. You know that kind of way? They just reiterate what somebody else has told them. And quite often, that advice doesn't hold water. You know, mm. um, and you can your first couple of comics can be very expensive if you listen to um, just secondhand advice from people. You know, you need to talk to professional. You need to see it done because otherwise you're just an ATM, you know, and <laughs> you've spent so much money on these things and you've, you've got a house full of comics and you can sell them anywhere because no one knows who you are. You're a first time author or publisher and no one's taking a chance on you. You know, and there aren't enough um, conventions to sell a thousand comics if it's your first comic. Mm. So people should really talk to a professional, someone who has done it, um, because they're going to guard their reputation by only giving you good advice. Whereas Jimmy down the road or whatever says, ah, oh, you know, I did this, I did that. You're just making the same mistakes he made. But I, don't course, think you uh, I don't, I don't yeah. think you should burnish uh, Jim's reputation like that. I think he's a... <laughs> A better man than that. Oh, you mean a different Jimmy? <laughs> different Jimmy, yeah. <laughs> different Jimmy. I tend not, to use, not our Jim. I tend to use Jimmy down the road for everything, and it's only, yeah. it's only, you know, it's Jimmy just down the road. Like, you're a fluke like the that Jimmy's down the road, you know. <laughs> like Jimmy is the wee boy next door. The wee boy next door told me to do it. It's all right. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, when my first self-publishing thing cost me, I can't remember how much it cost me. Maybe six, seven hundred pounds. I printed 500 copies of a comic. I think I sold 30. Yeah. I, I definitely took a lot to the dump. <laughs> you know, I spent a lot of money and wasted a lot of money. Um, and I, I'm kind of, I, I've, I've, I'm in the bag a wee bit for my son who loves writing and drawing his own comics. I will, I will pay for them to get printed, but I know how many sell. I know, you know, print 25. Print, I mean, but he's only 13, 14. So he's quite content to even get one copy for himself, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I I would say though that like the the big thing the the thing which I think um is important for comics people and the and the thing I find most with people who've never made them before is they're often sort of looking for that bit of permission that bit of kind of am I allowed to do this and and it's yeah. it's a weird thing because I think comics one of the nicest most unforgiving thing most forgiving thing about comics is you can make them with some paper and some staples you don't you don't need well you'll need a pen. That's it. You know, you don't need much more than that. If you've got access to a photocopier, you can make multiple copies. You can do it's it's so easy to make them. Um, and 
the biggest pro the biggest and most difficult thing is distribution and selling them and all of that stuff but actually making comics is dead easy but a lot of people get stuck at the making comics part you know they get sort of fixated on it or they they kind of go oh my first comic's going to be like a thousand pages it's a massive magnum opus that's going to cover this this and this and it's like no it's not no 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 your first comic should be eight pages long six pages four you know do a, do a four page thing that you can photocopy and and give it away do something with it show it to people meet people so uh, that's really my is, general advice it really is Nobody an where it up. you just... have to do something to find out what you did wrong first yeah. and then mm. you move on and you learn everything you do even if it's expensive you learn but you have to start off small Everyone wants, as you said there, to have the magnum opus and to be, you know, famous from the word go. And that's not how it works. You know, you are you are better off starting off like minded people, get involved in yeah. anthology, do a four page or an eight page thing, try submissions to places, you know, but show people what you've done. And otherwise, you live in a fancy world thinking you're going to do a 200 page comic and it's going to sell a thousand page people to people it's it's not it yeah. just isn't you know start small and grow you know there's also oh, you gonna say uh, i was just gonna say um you've been really successful even though it's a small potatoes i suppose but you've been really successful on the amazon I am, on demand i am the biggest fish in the tiniest pond no <laughs> I, I i would say i'd say i'm uh, Success is a funny thing. I wouldn't. I would. I've I've had a couple of things I've put on online for for self publishing and stuff, but I wouldn't call it successful at all. Like I wouldn't. I mean, to me, successful is on those things. It's being able to get it done, not how many you sell. It's like, mm. did I did I get through all the right steps to get this done in the right way so I can get one copy for me? Yes, I did. Tick, tick brilliant. I've done that job. Um, and it, it means then down the line you can you know you can apply those skills later on to other things like it was very satisfying but now that I did a I think the most successful small press thing I ever did was kind of early days of my actual professional career I think it was about 2007 or something um, might have been earlier I did a wee collection of stuff called previously which was a collection of short stories and things that I'd drawn with other people in the small press area and I'd sort of collated them all together and I did that sold like gangbusters. That sold, I think, every two or three hundred copies of it. To me, that was huge. It's a huge success for a small press thing. Um, but you know, if I'm being completely honest, ninety nine percent of that so it sold because I was going, I'll do you a sketch with this, and people wanted sketches. <laughs> you know, they wanted to see a sketch. If they went away and read it, that's great. If they didn't, that, you know, that's fine. But I got the, to make the book, produce the book, and get the book in my own hands is, is lovely. Just to be able that, I'm sure you'll you'll find the same thing, right? Just having the book in your own hands is is nice because it is like every this industry is not big enough to really sustain a huge number of careers. It is not. It is not such a big industry that the and even industries that you think well there's mega bucks in that there's only mega bucks for a handful of people like most of the people in it are hobbyists or you know semi-professionals or people that are doing it for the love of it and i mean that's true that's that's true in sports it's true in um sports and arts uh theater you know acting dramas all, all sorts of things are like that you've got a couple of headline acts that make massive amounts of money and then you've got working professionals that go from gig to gig to gig, but they're essentially they're essentially in 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 the gold rush. The only pe people who, who get rich are people making shovels. They're the shovel makers. You know, they're moving from one thing to another, facilitating other people. And then you've got the workmen who you know the background players that will turn up to it. And uh, you know if you enjoy that, that's you enjoy it. You know try try and find the enjoyment in it. And um, if you're very lucky, you'll start making enough money, or you'll start making money. That you can consider sort of part of your income. I I worked in IT for the first eight years of my professional comic career. I was doing stuff for Judge Dredd. I was doing American comics. I was doing various other things. For eight years, I was working in IT because it couldn't pay enough for me to leave my day job. You know, and mm -hmm. at the moment, you know, I can go from month to month and go. This month is definitely a good one. Next two months are not going to be great. So you know. That's, that's the a harsh reality. Yeah, we, that's that's the kind of the, those are the kind of things that you need to hear right at the outset. Um, but for
for some reason, and everybody I know who writes, Ray writes and draws me and drawing and everything, it, it's the most um, satisfying or enjoying medium of entertainment. Oh, and yeah. You I mean, can't, you can't dissuade people from it once they get into comics and they're into it. They're into no. it. Yeah, no, no, that's I've always said that it's like you know, those those people you can very quickly see people who will turn up at a convention or something and you'll think to yourself, Yeah, they're 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 gonna end up either being a professional, they're gonna stick with it. And then you'll see other people and you kind of can tell very quickly, no, they're gonna they're gonna bounce off this because it's you know, they want quick answers, they want things to happen too quickly, they want fame quickly, they want this quickly. It's like it's not really the way it works. I mean, those people you know, for example, well, let's talk about Jock. I know Jock reasonably well. Jock is mega successful, mega huge. But I remember going to a convention with Jock, and he couldn't. You know, he was doing a lot of work for Wizards of the Coast, and he couldn't even he couldn't break two thousand AD. You know, and he'd been doing that for years, and 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 then it was later on the mega success came. So there's a lot of people that um, give up quite early because it's hard. You know, and and. And it's hard to make money. Like, you know, it's always easy to tell people, here's the advice for how to, here's here's how to draw comics. I can tell you how to draw comics. I can tell you how to make your comic look better. I can tell you how to letter. I can, t you know, I can do all of that. What I can't tell you is how to make any money from the bloody thing. You know, <laughs> you've thrown on your own for that. Um, and, it did you know, take it's a like, while. Yeah. The yeah, first couple yeah. we wasted money on them. But after yeah. that, um, we found out now that a graphic novel, it's more cost effective than four issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you're not paying for four covers, you're paying for one yeah. cover. And you might get a break on the artwork. Who knows? Um, yeah. But well, I mean, the, the thing, the thing is, four, like... sorry, the, sorry, the printing of four issues, let's say 24 page issues, yeah. is double at uh, putting them all together as one book. You yeah. Know? So almost immediately, we started to see money turning around on the new graphic novel. Yeah. Whereas before, Every single comic will lose money. Yeah. Now we have a different business model. We're not doing issues with English anymore. We're moving to something else. And we will do issues if there's a great idea that's only worth 20 pages or something. Mm. And something we really want to do is a vanity thing. Mm. But like I can tell you now, for us, the graphic novel, it, it's, it's making a difference that we can, we can keep going, ticking on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the graphic novel format. A lot of big, pub a lot of the big publishers are doing that as well because, oftentimes, the single issues are either losing money yeah. or they're maybe just about making enough money to to keep themselves going. And then it it is the the multi issues, and part and part of that reason is because there's a shelf life on single issues of a comic. Nobody nobody wants to pick up issue three when issue one is long gone you know That's it's right, it's a much harder sell whereas a graphic novel is one book you know it's 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 got an indefinite shelf life it can last forever whereas if you've got a four issue collection people are oh well you know that's already come out <laughs> you know you a magic one and when i had one issue back in 2019 i couldn't give it away yeah when we had three issues when covid was finished we went to a big convention at three issues four was on the way they were selling like crazy and now mm. sell them as for I give people a deal, and it yeah. sells. But you're right. People they buy one comic, they wait a year for the next one. But that tree comes along, they're going. Well, oh, do I want it? I mean, you you've got a couple of difficulties, especially when what you're doing is selling these things at conventions, and maybe you don't have it in a store. Your difficulties are are yeah. someone might see you and missed an issue. Yeah. Someone might see it and, you know, you might have run, you, your print run might have been, ended on issue one, but you've still got issues two, three and four to, to sell because, you know, you didn't print, you didn't print enough issue one because you weren't sure, weren't sure how to sell. Or someone might see it and think, well, you've got issue two and three, one, two and three. When, when are, when am I going to be able to buy issue four? And it's like, well, the next time a convention comes around, it's like, well, no, that's not a great answer. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems with single issues that are totally circumvented whenever you go for trade, you know, a graphic novel. But the graphic novel is obviously more expensive to produce, more expensive to, to make. And, and it depends. I mean, a lot of a lot of guys are sort of doing their own thing and not paying artists. Um, and I think, you you know, you're paying people, that you're writing the stuff and paying people, so, yes. which is great. Um, but, it you know, it does mean it's out-of-pocket expenses. <laughs> it's yeah. expensive to do. Um, but if it makes its own money back, then great. Well, if, if we could sell enough yeah. horse printing, and I could say to Jim, Jim, you get half what that is, that'd be fantastic. Mm. But I, 
Jim had an eye opener recently when he found out how many copies I have to sell or something to make that money back. Just yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Is, you know, yeah, 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 it is. It was yeah. amazing. But we have one called City of Clowns. We did that as a joke, kind of. Um, and I didn't think it would sell. It's in third printing now, and it's breaking even. You know. Oh, wow. Um, wow. We did another one, Talking Gun, different kind of story. It's a very slow seller, but it sells every time you put it out. You know? mm. But I, I print a hundred copies. But then the other thing is, yeah. like when you're doing that's when you're doing sense. conventions, yeah. when you're doing conventions, you're paying for a table as well. So that's yeah. that's even the selling of it is expensive. If you have one comic, which we did mm. stupid thing back in the day, and um, back in twenty eighteen, we had one comic. We went to every convention, paid a fortune for these things. One comic, mm. a science fiction comic, and nobody wanted it. Mm. Now we have a range of things on the table, so we're paying for the table anyway, and yeah. we notice what things to push forward and what aren't selling at different things. And um, because if you're going somewhere as being a lot of kids, you're not going to sell a vampire western. You know? No, no. But Eric, well, I've I've always felt, like crazy. Like, yeah, mm. I've I've always like when I've done conventions, uh, I do conventions obviously. Um, generally, I'm there. I've, if I'm lucky, I've got some comps with me. If not, I'm sketching for people. But I, I like to try and have things for every price point. Like there's a five point thing, there's a twenty point thing, you know, there's, there's a fifteen point thing, a twenty five point thing, and a hundred point thing, and so that there is a there can be a kind of I don't really can't afford that, but I can't afford this, you know, kind of thing. Um, and that's that's one way to do that. But I also I mean I don't know if it's still true, but it used to be it was far easier to sell a print for a tenner than it would be to sell a comic for three pound. I mean, go figure. I don't. I don't know why or how, um, but people were quite reluctant to to buy comics where they'd be very happy to buy, you know, buy a print. Yeah. So yeah, again, that ad. swings and roundabouts. Um, yeah. Print is like a, something you put on your wall, and you see something. Mm. Like, oh, look at that! I'm supporting the artist. That's fantastic. But you buy a comic, you'll come back and buy the next comic. You may not buy yeah. the next print that artist does. In that kind of way. Yeah, yeah. So it's well, I mean, I think, I think dep- kind of. depends on the shows, but a lot of shows actually, there's a, there's quite a lot of the audience are not there or interested in comics. Oh, they might like yeah, Batman, yeah. Yes, but yeah. they're not interested in Batman yeah. comics, you know. And so, so you're sort of, if you have a Batman print, they'll definitely buy it. Yeah, a Batman definitely. comic, not yeah, not yeah. much interest in there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, it's hard. I, mean, I don't know. Like my, I say my son's doing his own stuff, so I'm kind of dipping my toe in small press, but only only for on his behalf in some ways and it's really difficult to get people to read stuff for free even you kind of find that that it's like you're given this is good stuff this is entertaining stuff do you want it do you want it do you want it it's like mm. and I, I recently put up a um my own comic it was a, it's a collection of little short strips that i've written over the past few years that are kind of scribbly drawn ones so that i haven't spent the time to really draw them and I was thinking, if I do these, I put them up, let's see how that goes. And if that goes okay, then you know what? I might maybe spend some effort on the next one that I do. Ah, not worth it. They I think I sold I think I sold, I don't know, a handful of thirty, maybe, if I was lucky. Um and you know, I mean I like two hundred and seventy five dollars, which is, you know, bobbins. I mean that, that wouldn't pay me to do a page of artwork really. Um so it's it's kind of yeah, and you're stuck thinking if I put more effort in, would I've sold more? And you're thinking if you'd put more effort in, it would cost you more to do. Wouldn't have made any more money necessarily because that that skill of selling is difficult. Just getting people to know that it exists and getting people to see it. But how many shows a year are you doing, Ray? Um, we try and do as many in Dublin as we can. We were going to everything in Ireland, but that's a waste because we don't go to cosplays. We don't go to game conventions anymore. Um, mm. it's the media type ones, the pop art ones, you know, pop culture stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. We did in Dublin. I, I missed out because of family circumstances on Enniskillen, which is my favourite. I love Enniskillen. Um, mm-hmm. But we we prepared back this year, COVID. Um, we had trouble with our car. My wife wasn't well. I don't drive, you know. Yeah. But we'll be going tomorrow next year. Um, yeah. Eventually, Anna Skillen was Anna Skillen was great, by the way, but it was a much yeah. skilled back show. Yeah, it was a very skilled back show. But uh, Garth was there, and so I, I had a bunch of comps of things that I'd drawn with uh, Garth had written, 
and Garth didn't have anything to sell. He was just signing stuff. I had a load of books to sell for written by Garth, so I did gangbusters. <laughs> I made out like a bandit. Um, but you know, at the same time, I wasn't selling anything that, that was not small press stuff. It was Garth's name was selling those things. Yes. And the fact that he was sat beside me signing. Do you find any difference when, say, Jim is there sketching things or signing stuff while you're selling books? Does that we, make no difference or does it make a difference? Have, has, has he done it yet? No, I haven't, I haven't been And yet. that score, the lads from um, Comic Book Guys, I was talking to Aaron and he said... Uh-huh. If you contact Jim and find out a day when you're free, I'll make the trip up there. We'll do a signing. Oh, really? Right. Okay. Well, yeah, I haven't. And this has been my, well, I'm in a, a slightly, um, just tough, my, my kids are still young and the weekends are really difficult and everything. But, you know, I mean, it's just something I've got to do. And it's, I'd love to Jim, do what I want to do. you've got but... to tell your family, you've got to have this weekend to be weekend famous. <laughs> just put your foot down. Say, I'm, look, do you know, even know who I am? I, yeah. now, I'm only going to be an arsehole for this weekend, but do you, for this weekend, do you know who I am? I'm signing a book. Now, yeah. You sort yourselves out, and come Monday, you can slap it up me all you like, but this weekend, I'm doing a signing. Well, we've got it. We're Ray and I are working on a book at the moment, and like, I mean, yeah, that's the, I mean, I'm so, I'm really, really, really excited about it. I've been excited about all the books we've worked on. So the, 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 trick, the trick will be to, to do launch something big launch something well, significant not to do the third issue of a thing but to do something big and significant when you're there because then you'll you'll get a little you know you, it's more buzz people will be interested in seeing it and and um signings are a funny thing like if like it's possible you and i'm not you'd be an arsehole i'd be an arsehole if i were to do this but it's possible to go to a comic shop and say hey i'm i'm a comic artist and i've got books out every month can i come in every week to sign something and then yeah. a sign-in loses all meaning yeah, you know yeah. so you want to you want to make it a significant event for you and for the comic shop and stuff and yeah. to launch a book and to do something and they i tell you now i, I think they would fall over themselves if you if you did a special limited edition cover or limited edition print for the for that shop for the signing yeah. um i think you'd do you'd do gang you'd clear it up you know um it would be great i have yet to do it i got a signing comic book guys i haven't done a signing on there yet ever it's my local comics. Well, it's one of three local comic shops in Belfast. But you need you you need to get uh, like uh, you. I don't know if uh, Ray, if Jim's told you this, but Jim, Jim, and I, because we've known each other for quite a long time, I've I've been at Jim for a long time to draw comics. I've said draw comics. Now Jim, in his turn, has has yeah, been at me. To, might have mentioned it once or twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but Jim, in his turn, has mentioned to me and said to me, "Oh, you should be painting. I should. You should get a canvas oh. and you should paint some stuff." And I. And I I took a stab at it and I didn't like it. Right, I took one stab. Jim was like, "Take smear some paint along the canvas, and that'll give you a sense of the paint and the atmosphere of it." And I did that, and I thought that just looks like I smeared some paint along a canvas. I I would rather draw some comics. And I've been at Jim to draw comics because he's always he's always loved comics. He always seems to be doodling. He was always doodling Batman or whatever. And 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 there, it's almost like, do you know when you're eating something and you're out for dinner? And you're with a friend or something and you're eating and they've ordered something that they don't really like. And you've got something that they definitely like and you're eating it. And you're going, this is really nice. And they're just, they're staring at your food and kind of drooling a bit. And you're going, do you want some of this? And they're going, no, 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 no. It's all right. It's all right. And you, and you eat some more and they go, do you, are you sure you don't want some? I think you can have some. No, 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 no. Don't want that. that was what Jim was like with comics. I'm going, Jim, you should draw comics. Oh, no, 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 no. And I eventually I convinced him to go down to Dice. Do you remember? Even that was a struggle to convince you to go to Dice. I yeah. said, go down to Dice. Because I felt if he goes to a comic convention, because uh, like comics isn't just drawn a, on a piece of paper. There's That's one element of it, obviously. That's, you know, that's an important part of it. Writing a story, drawing a story, crafting a thing. But it's also like getting paper cuts from putting the book together and, and meeting other people who are really into comics. And, and like doing this stuff in isolation is fine, but meeting a whole bunch of people and saying they're all into the same stuff and also seeing other people doing the same things that you want to do and re- thinking to yourself, I have got limitations and I cannot do this as well as other people. And then you see other people doing it and realizing that they are fighting the same exact same limitations, but they don't care. They're there or, or at the very least they care, but they're still doing it anyway. And then seeing that and going, well, why, 
well, I mean, like they're doing it. It's not as, and, and to be fair to Jim, I, like I've definitely, I mean, I think I've, I've had to, it's difficult to accept this in my head, but I think there's a kind of, I mean, Jim said this to me a lot, I think anyways, is that uh, he sees that I struggle with comics because everyone does. And in turn, he's thought, well, PJ struggles with comics and making money and doing all that stuff. And is also like, I don't know, nine million times better than me. I, I don't know what figure you have in your head for how much better nine you imagine I have, Jim. That's, that's a good nine million, nine million is a good figure. And he, PJ's nine million times better than me. That must mean I, it would be nine million times harder for me. And that's not really the way it works. <laughs> you know, that's not the... So I think, I, I mean, it definitely felt to me that, um, and I don't know, I, 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 this is just my interpretation of what, what happens, but it felt to me that Jim going to Dice was like a eureka moment. It was like a because after that you then put the finger out and actually started doing a lot more work like there was a lot of comics then produced and i and when i've seen you know lots of things start, projects start and not get anywhere because um you kind of it never matches the ambition you have in your heart you know mm. you you want to get to it and you, you imagine that it should be this good and it's never that good because there's a, a great um uh oh i can't remember there's a, a thing called I can't remember the guy's name, but this is this big speech about uh, what he calls the gap, the gap between your ambitions and your abilities and how your ambitions, if you're an artist at all, your ambitions are always way ahead of your abilities. And the moment your abilities catch up to your ambitions, your ambitions just leap ahead again because now they are no longer ambitions. They're now your abilities. So you, you, so you kind of look further afield and start thinking, well, if I can do this, then I should be able to do that. And so your ambitions are, con there's this constant gap and at the start of a creative career, that gap is very obvious. That gap is really difficult because that gap is the difference between I want to draw Batman and I see Jim Lee drawing Batman and I want to draw Batman and I look like a two-year-old is drawing Batman. And and but as you get as you get better and your ambitions, you know, the moment you get to an ability level where you think, oh, this is actually not too bad, and you think, I oh, Oh, look at Magnolia's Batman! Oh my God! And suddenly, you know, you you're you're kind of scaling that gap again. And I think that was the that's it felt to me like Dice was the thing for Jim to kind of realize that that didn't have to be a limiting factor. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, Jim. What would you say? No, definitely right. And you've got what I see. I've talked about this as well with Ray for, for a while and a couple of times on the podcast. Um, where I went to art school. So in art school, it's really it's hard to explain to people because there was the a sequential art course or part of it and actually drawing and the ability to draw and uh, how skillful a person, any person was at drawing. There are some people at our college who, who literally, and, and one guy in particular, who freely hands up admitted he, that he couldn't draw, he had no drawing ability whatsoever um and that was that blew my mind that you, you, i thought oh you have to be really really good at drawing to, to go to art school you know to go to university at art school and um that wasn't it and in fact they would say anything other than draw an art course i remember on our course um they would talk about um making marks and then we'd talk about uh invoking a line or invoking a, a curve or something like this and almost like anti-drawing. It was very, mm. very odd. It's a really odd because what you're learning is how to be an artist, not how to, not the skill of drawing or, or something. Um, so a drawing was just sort of a, a, an attachment. So that was my, that was my... Um, I, think for, I think for a while, draw, the ability to draw was seen as kind of elitist. Kind of, you can yeah, draw, was, stop yeah, showing definitely. off. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. you should, you know, I, 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 I don't get me wrong like I definitely think there is a place I mean I've seen art which is not mark making in the way that illustration would be and mm. I think I think illustration is different from you know a painting or, or, or you know there, there's illustration there's all sorts of forms of art I don't have the vocabulary for it because I never went to art school I went to study computers and <laughs> the um but like I've seen art that I've kind of gone, wow, that's not illustration, but that has an emotional context and has yeah. a resonance that that maybe, yeah. you know, I mean, the two, I posted this on Twitter the other day, the two recent things which are nothing like illustration whatsoever, but are undeniable to me at any rate, works of art 
in that they are almost singular visions of genius are the um, uh, Donald Glover uh, singing his Childish Gambino, the video for uh, This Is America, which is like, if you see it, is absolutely knockout. It's a kind of, it's it's essentially a, a um, narrative about American violence and, and how that is a, a, a treated in America. It's just, it's an incredible, it's a music video with a song. And that to me is art. Like that, that is undeniable to me that that is art. And the other is, um, I'll throw in a third in a second, but the other is the uh, Bo Burnham's Inside, which is a an hour long musical comedy thing, right? Now, I don't know if you've seen this, yes. but it is it is an incredible piece of art. There's no other way to describe it. It's just one person over the course of a year over lockdown making a music videos in their house on their own. And it, it's an absolute work of genius. But none of those things are illustrations. So I accept that there are things outside of illustration. There's also somebody posted recently to me um, on Twitter uh, a sculpture. And it's a sculpture called Stress, right? And it is a, it's like a block of concrete, two blocks of concrete with at an angle. And where the angle is, it, the top block is kind of slightly off kilter from the bottom block. So it's slightly further down. And where these two, two blocks of concrete meet are rows and rows of teeth. And like human, like, they look like human teeth, but they're 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 made of concrete. And you look at that, and you feel stress. Like you can't you can't look at that statue and not feel genuinely stressed out about it because it looks like it looks like a statue of teeth grinding, even though it's it's concrete. You know, so there is to me there's a value in art. I think the problem with art college is they completely they just decided illustration was not art. And that, mm-hmm. and because of that, they and there was a generation of people who should have been doing illustration that were completely lost to it because art college tried to beat the illustration out of it. I mean, it's different now, and a part of that I think is because now there are more jobs in illustration. There's jobs in um, video games and, and film and TV and stuff that you know essentially you go through art college for those courses. So you know those those things are. It's better. It's a lot better, I think. If you're an illustrator, that's a. There's, I think, because there was never a kind of obvious job at the end of it for illustration or for art in general. I mean, it was basically let's turn you into an artist. And to be an artist, you've got to be able to. You've got to be Tracy Emin, or you've got to be. Well, there, um, yeah, your other you can man. definitely. There's a. You know, there's a de- a degree. And people, your know, friends of mine, were doing a degree in illustration, and that's fine mm. and um, terrific. And that's that was my background, but. Uh, you imagine turning up to the offices of Marvel or DC or something with two pieces of concrete and some teeth in between it. And yeah, saying, yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to draw uh, Batman or something. You know, it yeah. doesn't. And, and that but was that, the but thing. that's that's the but, thing I think that's great about comics is like if you want a job in comics, draw some bloody comics. And and if you want to go to if you want to show someone that you can draw comics, have some comics drawn. That's yeah. it. There is no, you know, certainly there's value to learning how to do all the storytelling. There's value to all of that stuff. And there are things that you can be taught, um, although there are no courses for those things in Northern Ireland, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and there, there are, I think, the courses that exist are probably American. There might be some European courses, but there are storytelling skills you can learn. But for the most part, a, a lot of that you can learn yourself by just doing, you know. I mean, and again, I go back to my, my son, Thomas, who at age 13 or 14 now has maybe written and drawn five or 600 pages worth of comics on his own, off his own volition. And they are good storytelling. They're, like the storytelling, you know, whatever merits of the of the story are, the storytelling's always really good, you know, because he's yeah. intuited the storytelling. And by the time he is 18, I would say he, if he keeps going at the rate that he's going, he'd be a phenomenal storyteller. Like, yeah. uh, you know, just a phenomenal artist who can who can very quickly creatively come up with stories so um i just have to see them from comics that's all how does it feel to you then that from where you are where you think you are in your career um people would die to have your career like you're uh, from people would say i would love to be where you are um where do you you ever have you ever read have you ever read have you ever read grew the wanderer you must have read grew Oh yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a um, grew the wanderer. Grew is a, a barbarian, savage samurai, amazing or amazing fighter who wanders the land, killing people by accident 
he's also an absolute idiot, complete idiot. So it's kind of Conan, um, but it's it's drawn by Sergio Aragonés, uh, written by Marco Vanier, uh, Vanier. Um, and it is very funny. Uh, and Gru is accompanied everywhere by a little dog called Refuto. Refuto. And there's one episode in which another dog, so Refuto the dog, much smarter than Gru, but somehow admires Gru for all of the terrible things he does. Like, Gru, no one can survive an encounter with Gru. People are frequently calling him a mendicant, which is, means a wanderer, and he's frequently getting offended by that uh, appellation, even though that's exactly what he is. And sometimes, like, the jokes will be, one character sort of will say, say, you're a bit slow. And about 12 pages later, Gru will turn around to him and says, wait a minute, did you call me slow? And then kill him. <laughs> um, so it's very funny, very funny. Uh, but there's one one strip in it where uh, referred to the dog, finds another dog who just admires him. And and ultimately, at the end, the, the end of this little story, the motto, because every Gru comic comes with a motto, the motto in it is, you know, there's always someone going to look up to you, no matter who you are, whatever level you are, there will always be someone prepared to look up to you. There, for every person who there is to look up to me, anyone who knows your career, Jim, will look up to you as well. You will find there are people looking up to you, no matter what level you're at. There will be people who will be envious because they want, to be able to do what you want that, that you can do and you know and that's not necessarily a bad thing I mean that's you know that can be an energy that can be a thing you know we're quite envious of the fact that Ray's been able to put these books together and do these books and take them up and down to shows and stuff that's an admirable thing that's you know to be able to self-publish your own stuff that's great to me what I've always been trying to get to is a point where I get paid well enough that I can pay my bills and that um, I can get to draw fun comics you know Everything after that is like, I don't have, you know, I know too many, um, an amazingly, amazingly good Irish artists like Declan Shalvey and, you know, um, uh, Will Sliney and Roach and, and guys like that who have careers that I know other people would desperately envy. Um, my career is enviable if you like Judge Dredd. I mean, beyond that, you know, and I know, for example, that I've talked to uh, uh, Declan and Declan's career is like, off to, off to the moon and you would think to yourself well you know Declan's got it all he's, he's doing a creator own book he's got two creator own books out or he will have two creator own books out he's got a great career at Marvel he's done covers for Marvel and DC I know for a fact Declan would love to work with Garth and I've worked with Garth loads and I sit there going ha ha I've done that and you haven't so I, I don't I don't take it I don't take it as anything other than you have something that would be I would love to do which I also have I mean there's so many people have things that I would love to do. I'd love to do what uh, Ray's doing. I'd, you know, and I, I don't have any daughters. I'd love to have some, you know, it would have been nice to have a daughter, but that's, that's fine. I, you know, there are things that um, I think everyone has that other people would envy, you know, and I don't yeah. think it's harmful to have that. And I think it's also kind of healthy to realize that sometimes you think you want a thing, but you don't necessarily really want that thing. You want the easy part of it. You don't want the hard part of it. I want... I want to self-publish my own books like you, Ray, but I don't want to go around comic shows and sell them all, please. That seems like a lot of work. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want the organizational part of it. I don't want any part of the, having to figure out where what deadlines are and all that stuff. That seems like work. So yeah, yeah, everyone's, I mean, absolutely people will see Dread and think, and oh God, I'd love to draw Dread. And, and God, yeah, I mean, that's exactly where I was. And then the reality is you kind of do it and you think, well, this is great fun, but there's a limit, you know, there's a limit to doing these things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we all like we all carve out our own way anyway. I mean, there's no, you know, there's nothing wrong with being right at the start of your career and kind of going, I envy these four or five people, and these are the people whose careers I would like to have, and then sort of steering yourself in that way up to, uh, up to the point where you become peers, and then you're sitting talking, and you realize, oh, okay, well, the you know the life of it is different from the you know the reality of it is different than my imagined kind of fantasy of it you know yeah because it is i mean it is a sort of imagined fantasy of it would be everything would be so much easier if i was doing this thing we and we all get it you see somebody's got a gig and you think oh why can't i do that gig and then you realize you've got a couple of ongoing gigs as is and and yeah. you know you're you're on your own so yeah so i mean i don't i don't give any real i mean i don't I don't think there are people out there who really envy me. I think there's definitely people who go, who get excited when they meet me because I've drawn Judge Dredd, but I've no idea who I am. You know, I mean, I definitely have experienced that where people go, oh my God, Judge Dredd, wow. And you go, when, oh, you read Dredd, Dredd. Oh, I used to read it when I was 10. 
and you're what 50 now so yeah you've never seen my artwork then no 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 but you've drawn them that must be amazing it's going well yeah okay it's so slightly you know slightly different it's a weird kind of fame isn't it because you, you you're very um i just mean comic artists and writers uh all fame is weird. weird jim all fame is weird as i was saying to my mate jonathan ross <laughs> <laughs> Did I ever tell this, you his Jonathan this, Ross story? This, this, is, we I, this is a genuine, genuinely, right? Genuinely, I was talking to Jonathan Ross about fame and how fame doesn't travel and how uh, we were in Derry with my kids my, and there was a, a guy, it wasn't Stampy, but it was someone like Stampy, you know, one of those YouTubers that were doing Minecraft stuff and he turned up, My every adult in the room didn't know who it was, they were just looking at him and every child was so excited they were fit to burst. And I was going, it's weird how fame has these little kind of, you yeah. know, it's almost, tra- it's it's not just transient. It doesn't just come and go, but it's got little little sectors, you know, you're famous in certain areas. And he was saying, yes, because, and this is there's a lot of name clanging in this, I, you'll have to forgive me. But uh, so Jonathan Ross goes, yeah, when me and Neil Gaiman are walking around London, and this is prior to Sandman taking off, or, or prior to kind of the Sandman TV show and stuff, um, this was a few years ago. Me, me and Neil Gaiman walking around, around London. Uh, nobody knew who Neil Gaiman was. So they're coming up to me and go, oh, Jonathan Ross, I don't know. He says, but when Neil Gaiman and I were walking around New York City Comic Con, everyone knew who Neil Gaiman was and nobody knew who I was. So everyone's going, oh my God, it's Neil Gaiman. Who's that guy with him? It's like, it's really, yeah. it's really weird. So I, I used to call it Weekend Famous Comics. You know, I'm famous on the weekend, but you're only famous to a small subset of people. And if you give it enough time, they all become your mates. And so it's, it seems a bit silly to think of it as fame in any way, shape, or form. I mean, it I always, it, it, it never feels, you know, it's not, it's fame in the very, you know, it's, as I, I tell people, it's like there's the A, there's the A list and the B list and the C list, and then you get to the Z list. And then whenever you get past the Z list into the uh, Greek letters, there's alpha and beta, and then down to gamma. And then when you get past gamma and you've run out of all the letters of the alphabets of every language, then you get into the color lists. So there's red list and blue list and so on. And then once you get past the blue list and into the ultraviolet uh, and non-visible spectrum, that's the level of fame I'm at. That's that's the list I'm I'm ultra, you know, I, I think I'm at a sonic level dogs can only hear level of fame. That's the kind of, you know. So on the, on the other hand, think, Ray, um so the the two bugs books are right there now. And they're and they're they're it's like those uh, seeds you know they're planted and everything it's a weird thing to think of you know they're out there and people will read them and everything and people will be aware of you um, um, to whatever extent you don't know um, but the very yeah. idea like it, um, somebody is out there and will you tell a story tell somebody they know oh I picked up this book the other day and it's a weird feeling to think that it's really really peculiar it's a really odd thing every show we go to now Somebody comes up and um, when is Jim going to be here? You know, yeah. really? they think that Jim lives down the road, you know, um, <laughs> and we have, you know, we have fans, people who come from all around and they want the next two pugs thing. Wow. And it's, it's lovely to hear, but we can't produce, you know, Jim is one man, but he's only one man. He's, you know, you only do go so fast, but, um, but, but go lots faster, of people, Jim. Go faster. Yeah, lots of people show up and they buy the newest thing. They take a chance on the newest thing because they recognize your name, recognize two pugs, you know. And that's weird. That like, that's show, crazy to me. They say, I, I, I'll take that. And the things that they wouldn't ordinarily buy. Like, I've sold right. lots of magic books and the, the people who were only interested in science fiction, you know, back, back in the day, yeah. four or five years ago, that's all they wanted. Ask me. Do more of this, do more Soma, do more Soma. Now they buy the magic thing because take a chance on it. They trust us. You know, that that, that's a fantastic it's... feeling though. Yeah. We were talking about that, right? Do you remember the life of a book? That's how they oh, yes. how books yeah. that we've read and how they, they change as we get older. The book obviously stays the same, but that's the life of a book. You read something like uh, uh, Watchmen when you're 18 and it blows your skull off and then you change and hang on a minute. And I'm not so sure. And to think that that's one of your books out there, one of your books out there, and I read this thing in two pugs, and you know, it's out there. I blow that blows. That's the thing that excites me about comic books more than anything. Um, I just think that think that you've got a piece of artwork out there, 
that some kid, because Paul and I, I used to go to Paul's house and I, I, I'd sit down and I, he'd usually give me a couple of comic books to go away and do. And, um, and I copied the drawings. I would copy Batman or whatever it was um, uh, to try and learn how to draw. And uh, there's another thing was uh, that's not copying. It's we talk about Paul and I would talk about problem solving. How does this artist solve that problem of anatomy or buildings or something like that? And I would study it like that. And you know, sit down, and look at it. And the, but the idea like of writing story writing um, and people have got one of your books out there and are reading it and think, all right, okay, I can do this. I can do a story about vampires in a Western. Never thought of that before. Hang on a minute. And it, that blows my mind. That really, really blows my mind. Well, at this time, we had a few people come to us. And one guy had a handwritten, he's only a kid, like 17, 18 maybe. And he had made his own comic, hand-drawn. But he'd only drawn the figures in the foreground. And I was saying to him, do you have backgrounds at all? He goes, who needs backgrounds? <laughs> So, this is more like animation style that you're doing here like it's you know he's moving the same yeah. character around the page but at least he had the idea of sequential art and when i said to him that's sequential he goes what's that but he had made his own comic without even knowing what sequential art was what it was called yeah and almost immediately afterwards two lads showed up they've been sent down by another publisher to see would we take them on and they had a book their mom was showing me stuff on his phone it was beautiful and his mate was going to let her it and um, real horror stuff you know but at the moment we can't do much because we're trying to get the, the curler book off the ground you know? yeah. and yeah. that's where the money's going that's we can't take on anything else yeah but this color one it's a huge departure and you can see the difference in your art than it was like five years ago four years ago yeah this yeah. is completely different there's still touches of jim in there but you it's can still- see how you're approaching this way way different I had to. The Paul, why am I not getting it? all comps of all of these books? I don't understand why. Why no one's yeah, sending I'll, me I'll, comps. I'll, I'll I feel like I actually. like. I feel like you're, you're with what you're Ray. You're working with one of my oldest friends. I. I mean, let's be honest. I set you on the road for comics. Why am I not getting comped on all of these books? What's yeah. going on? I will sort you out. I will pick you up. But he, Paul, right. Paul will tell you that I hid my work from him for. I still do. I think. Don't. Yeah. Oh, I. Year, year, you won't show me year. anything. Yeah, he didn't tell me. He didn't tell me Ray that time he bought a a, a Wacom Cintiq screen either. For some oh. reason, I don't never even now. I still haven't figured this out. He just he just didn't tell me he bought one. We hadn't. We were sort of we talked a lot about artwork and how technique and stuff and and we I think we'd probably talked about getting a Cintiq. This is early early days of Cintiqs. Very expensive items. Uh, like you'd have you know a thousand pounds you'd have to drop on on something you'd never seen before you know that's yeah. that's the kind of it's like would this work would this not work and <laughs> i think i said to jim i'm thinking of buying a cintiq and he went jim who i've known for decades jim went oh i bought one a few weeks ago i just didn't i didn't want to tell you about it no that's not <laughs> it that's not it just didn't, not just didn't want to tell it you really it. Is it. that's not it that's not it that's not it let me just tell you the I've truth. drawn hundreds of pages for me Jim says, yeah. I have something here. I'm trying to have a look at Ray. And he sends me a finished book. And Hi. this little character was fully formed. He had all the all the parts. It wasn't just drawn well. She was fully formed as a character. And I was blown away by it. And I said to him, <laughs> You son of a bitch, where are you hiding this for the last three years? He goes, Ah, oh, well, Ray, I didn't think it was that, you know, and put himself down. And he shouldn't put himself down. This was That's a good little story. Before- before he'd started, so I used to say to him about drawing comics, and before I sent it by the comic convention, he had done lots and lots and lots. He would tell me about story ideas, and I'd go, wow, that's amazing, that's yeah. incredible. And I like, I was envious of all of these things. I just couldn't, my brain wouldn't go there. Uh, and his was his was a way off, you know, Marley and Beck. Um, was, what was the fantasy thing? I can't remember the name of it. It was a big fantasy thing. And it sounded really great. And just lots and lots of ideas and story ideas. But none of the bloody things ever got, kind of they'd get to 12 sometimes you go i've done 20 pages of that and you go what yeah like and 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 i'd say well sure i'll letter it or something i'll help i'll let me yeah. and then it'd be you no know, all interest go and it's like god damn it um but it's i mean it is surprising how many people will sit in their house and write and draw comics and just never show them to anyone and you will never know about it and they will be buried forever and it's a shame like it's a shame because there's lots of great stuff out there but it would be great if if 
there were more readers and people were more open to picking up books and and yeah. you know i i, I kind of went down to a local comic shop the other day and said what's the small press scene like in belfast like we've got what four comic shops or something in belfast now there's um comic and heroes uh the coffee or no the, uh, uh, comics and heroes another or coffee and heroes the, 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 the and history Angry that, that, the one in Smithfield Market, the one you yeah, and I oh, bumped into each other one time. My book uh, is Angry Cherry. Come, yeah, well, that, no, that's in Derry. I'm talking about Belfast, just oh, Belfast, sorry. right? So just Belfast. Once you're over the border, it's all one big city to me. I, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> um, but like in Belfast City, like in Belfast City Centre, you can walk to each of these comic shops. Right. In the, you know, they're no further than 15 minute walk away from each other, and some of them are even closer than that. Some of them are two minute walk from each other. So Comics and Heroes uh, in Smithfield Market, um, Forbidden Planet in Belfast at uh, uh, Victoria Square, um, and uh, Comic Book Guys in uh, Great Victoria Street. Um, so there's three of them. And then there's another place that's opened up called um, Seventh Dimension, which is uh, up near Conswater if you're in Northern Ireland. Um, oh, nice. so, and, so there's four shops, right? So you would think to yourself, if someone wants to make and produce comics in Northern Ireland, what they would do is go to each of these comics shops and say, can you stock my comics for me? And they would go, yeah, sure, why not? So where the, uh, I think it was Comic Heroes, they were kind of going, well, there doesn't seem to be a market. There doesn't seem to be it's people making thing. these books. Yeah. Uh, I think there are. I think people are doing these things, but I think they're keeping it to themselves. And it's really kind of... You know, at a convention, it's yeah. different. But if they could pick up a book and read the back, look at the artwork inside... 50% of the people that walk by your table and stop buy something. Yeah. That's a huge number. Would you would you ever think, Ray, of organizing your own comic convention? No. <laughs> I don't like people. No offense. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I mean, it's not so much the... Um, it's like... So my dad's an antique dealer and has been for decades. And Jim knows about that. Uh, and he used to run... I mean, he would do antique fairs, you know, and he would run them as well because that gives him a table, that gives him a chance. And it's, I keep I keep thinking to myself, why, you know, is there enough people here in Northern Ireland to do for someone to kind of go, let's do a comic fair, a kind of little small press get together? Is there enough? And I know they're out there. I just don't know where they are, you know. Um, mm. But, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, but the other thing as well is I'm like, I'm stomping around in big, my big size 12 feet going, look at me, I'm a professional comic artist. Where are all you tiddlers at? Which is not what I'm doing, but it, it's you no, know, no, there's no, always no, that no. danger, no. you know, of no, looking no, like no. that. No, no, um, no, no, not at all. No, no. I, I think it's really important. That's this, and I've said this a couple of times before, where uh, you need the uh, you need the kind of an honest um, uh, picture of you know what it means to make comics and and to get involved in any writing or. But the, see, I was doing that. I did a workshop a couple of weeks ago about um, just for kids um, and drawing comics and everything. And time after time after time, when you, you know, explain to kids about um, the breakdown of who, how many people make the average comic, about six, writer, editor, um, um, penciler, anchor, and everything. See the idea whenever it gets into their head. And this is everybody who wants to make comics jumps into either the writing and the penciling. Whenever you tell a group of kids that you can sit around all day coloring in books, mm. like a colorist, you can just, that's your job to color in. Their heads almost bloody explode. Like really, you get paid money to sit and color in all day. So it's another part of the making books that, you know, this is really good to point it out to, um, this is what's involved in it. You know, yeah, it's kind of tough. Um, but anybody who's involved in it, Ray, right in there, you're not. I mean, we. I said we talked to Ray, and he's told me outline of these stories. Within five minutes, he's outlined these stories, and I'm thinking, who is this guy? Because Ray, like you and I, and Ray, we're you know ordinary looking blokes. We're not you know just ordinary looking. And then, you, but you have this call. I'm super handsome. Years. I think you'll find. <laughs> I'm a ski. I'm a, like a tan or something. Well, absolutely. I didn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. You know, I was trying to be a bit modest. But oh, yeah, for yeah. such an outwardly normal looking person, <laughs> yeah, outwardly normal, <laughs> outwardly normal. You've got this bubbling cauldron of these ideas, and I'm going, what? What are you talking about? Bloody vampires and 
you know. So there's that aspect of it. As hard as it is, if you didn't do these kind of things, you'd be sitting with all these noodles going on in your head where you'd have these ideas about vampires and and, and um, uh, um, barbarians and all sorts of things going on. It would just sit in your head. It wouldn't be able to get it out, you know, and that's a, it's a really important... Yeah, that, um, I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting question, right? As a writer, why not prose? Like, why, why not prose? Um, I wrote through my teens and my early 20s, and it was so difficult to get anything published in Ireland. I mean, I had mm. some success, but you you had to be... Had to have friends in RTE. You had to have all sorts, you know. Um, the average small writer couldn't, but you could go straight to beat the band. You could write these mm. things for someone else and get paid. Um, mm. But it was very much um, cause to lab every week. What was what was what was chick lit back then? I forget what it was called, but mm-hmm. there was tons of that. What I wanted to write wasn't marketable. Um, mm. I would rather spend ten years like a monk writing prose. I mean, my first scripts are very lengthy, very wordy prose, you know, um, mm. but it's self-destructive. The reason I got into comics was to get out of the house, to meet people, to make friends, because I've never made people friends. People who you earlier said you don't like. Yeah, I don't like people. <laughs> but I recognised my psyche, my being, I needed, I'm 61 years old this year, mm. I needed to get out, I needed to meet people, you know. Um, and I have, I've met lots and lots of interesting people doing this and I've got mm. tons of ideas off my chest, out of my head and um, I, I love it. It's hard, it's difficult, it can be a drain on everything, resources, your, your, your mind, your nerves, your stress is unbelievable sometimes but when it's finished, by the time you're selling the book, you're writing a book, not the next one, you're looking at Jim's art, you're lettering another one, you're doing all sorts. And it's a constant, yeah. constant thing. So you're, you, although you're stressed, you're also getting feedback all the time. It's a boost mm. as well. So it feeds itself. That's why yeah. comics. Um, and I find I became enraptured with comics, telling a story with just Polaroids, pictures, 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 pictures. Um, I, I, I just loved that. Mm. It's no easier than writing a book. People think, oh, sit down. You, how many words in this comic? A thousand. I can type a thousand in 20 minutes. Yeah, you know, that it takes 10 drafts for me to get one. Our newest one, Wolf, was four drafts for that. And mm-hmm. it's more like what I really think up in my head. You know, it hasn't been refined down to be nice for people to read. It's not going to be an easy read for people. You know? mm-hmm. um, but this is what I have to do. I have to get that out. And Jim yeah. is my enabler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you blame me. Don't blame me. I tell you. Don't I, I blame know. Me. <laughs> well, I spent half my time thinking, what will I impress Jim with? You know? <laughs> I, I, I have this fantasy in my head that when he gets the, the script, the first time he gets the script, he goes, um, oh, Planet of Orchids. Okay, what's this about? And then he starts scratching his head. You know? Um, yeah. And then we're into the book. And it's just such fun, you know. And yeah. it's, it's progressed, I and mean, we've gotten better. We've upskilled. No, it's it's brilliant. And um, you've got to get that stuff out of your head. Like you've got to, or yeah. else it's just in your head. You've got to get out of your head. And um, I was kind of going back to my art school training. That it took me a long time to, to switch that off, or not to switch it off, but to turn the boat. And I, I, yeah, those those first. Uh, um, early tries attempts were really really difficult and i was thinking of actually you know, bill sinkovich and um kent williams and i i would look and go oh, okay right i get it do you remember paul whenever i was first doing things like i wouldn't um i would just noodle and there would mm. be no i i just thought oh an, uh, an anchor would be able to read my thoughts and just do that just fix that up, just you know, tidy it. Yeah. And you were like, I've no. been there, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> Why is anybody going to read your mind and know is this a hand, finger? What what's going on? Here? Yeah. You know, really, really tough goal. But yeah, you've got to get it out. That was a real, um, 
a real struggle for me to kind of to shift that part of what I thought or my training and everything to to go into sequential art. Well, you you always used to say to me, I much prefer your pencils because they're not finished. And it's like, I know, but they have to be finished, Jim. <laughs> But here, but here, that's a really good point. So listen, you're noodling away here, and they're fairly tight sketches, yeah, and everything. Now I know for a fact there are artists who would turn that in, and you know too, you would turn that in as scratchy and as unfinished and polished, all the lines, you know, are are mm. kind of scratchy and everything. Who would turn that in? And I couldn't get my head around that. I go, well, that guy's doing it. But that's like it's the, perpet no. the perpetual. Um, uh cartoony oh that's too cartoony you know that kind of thing you go well hang on a minute that guy's doing this over there is it why how, how can they get to do it and you that, don't... that scratchy look right yeah. gives rise to ambiguity in what the character is doing you know yeah. um he's not clean cut he's not walking the right side of the line you know that kind of way yeah so that that look there in the right comic would fit in really well you know yeah Dark and murky feeling. You don't need to. Well, be... I, I have like that. That's the that's the thing with like, those little the recent um, small press thing I did where I kind of collected a bunch of stories. They are, they are all scratchy. They are all unfinished. But I just look at them and think, I mean, letting go of that as an unfinished piece. A lot of them were like, well, this is hard to do. Some of them are more finished, but still scratchy and scrappy, and I don't like them. And there's a couple that are sort of unfinished, but I actually quite like them as they are. But there's ones where I just look at it and think, no, that needed to be finished, more finished than it is, more polished than it is. And um, but you're right, there are some things you kind of go, oh, I could, I, you know, I could see how that would work. I mean, this, this, the Batman's that I'm drawing there, scratchy things. I might do something like that in a flashback or something. Or, you know, it's, it's it, that's when I might lean into that kind of um, scratchier thing. But um, you know, um, but you know, I, yeah, I see that Batman there with the emblem on his chest. Now, yeah, just the little um, lines inside the emblem itself. There are definitely, yeah. definitely published works where I've seen artists, probably a Bill Sienkiewicz, who would leave it at that level of scratchiness. Yeah, there's nothing. I, mean, I don't. I don't actually think there's anything wrong with that. No, all. no, I don't, I don't either. You know, because, um, but but it doesn't suit everything. You know, it doesn't yeah. suit every single story type. It doesn't suit every single drawing you're doing, and. And a lot of it's about intent. Like my intent here is to do a scratchy, sketchy sketch, not to do a finished piece. If I was doing a finished piece, I might go, yeah, that that's not going to fly for me. I'm going to have to finish that off a wee bit, make that a yeah. wee bit more polished looking. Um, but you know, it's it's all about intent and stuff. So, well, look, um, Jim promised me, or I promised Jim, I'd only chat for an hour. So, I mean, I'm already going over there. I think by uh, five minutes, I'm a, I can keep going. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, writing. Yeah. Um, do you like it? Or is it necessary? Like... What's that? Sorry, um, I missed the first part. Writing, do you like it or is it a necessary evil? Is it something you have to do to get a story? Or do you enjoy well, crafting the story and then drawing it? Well, I, I think, I think writing is, I think the difficulty is the words you're using. So writing is, when people say write, what they mean is sitting at a typewriter and typing out the story, right? And in that element, you don't necessarily need to do that. If you're drawing your own story, you don't need to do that because I've done most of the stories I've written and drawn. I wouldn't say I've written them, but they definitely were conceived in my head and I dialogued characters in a way, in a, in a story fashion, and there was a plot there. I just didn't literally write it. So... There, there's always a so if you, so if you take the word written out of that right and let's replace it with something like something nice and wanky like ideation so yeah, the, yeah. I, to, you know so so all stories are ideated all stories have to be thought of first of all that's the first process of any storytelling is the conceit and the conception of a story you've got to think of it and then you've got to kind of figure out how it works and the plot points and there's this and that, and that. And that's the bit that people talk about as writing, but that's not really writing. Writing is the bit where you sit down and type the whole thing out. So for comic artists, and I know there was a big brouhaha a few years ago where I think um, the creator Ren and Stimpy said something like, we don't need writers, right? Mm. There's a massive blanket mad statement saying we don't need writers. And it was because he did animations where there was no writers involved. 
but he was doing all of the things a writer does except writing the stuff down so yeah. so that itself is writing that don't you mean that so when we talk about writing it's because most people who do that ideation process and that process of coming up with a story idea and that process of thinking it through and plotting it out and so on do not draw they do not draw those stories so they've got to get those stories out so if you were you know if you go back pre-written word and you were doing that you'd be called a storyteller you know that's yeah. what that's that's what you are you're a storyteller and so um that's what we've done is we've replaced the story the, the audio the verbal storytelling with typing and people have used that word of writing to mean the other word of storytelling so storytelling is absolutely essential it's absolutely essential. The ability to sit down and think of a story and come up with a plot and come up with how that works and who these characters are, all of that absolutely essential. You don't need to write it. You can just straight away draw it or you can tell it to someone. It's still it's still storytelling. You know, if you want to have a comic and you're working with a team of people, you do need to write it. You need to sit down and write it out so that the other people can read this and see what you're doing. I, I, I sense Ray's got a massive disagreement there, but that's... You, Come at me, Ray. Come at me. I can look, walk by a table and look at a book and know that the artist spent very, very little time writing the story. Who just felt yeah, that? Yeah, but that, but but but, 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 yeah, but what I'm saying, Ray, they run out of steam. You know. Yeah. They, they've short. They've short. <clears throat> it. Well, that's true. Technically, a huge shortcut. You know. Yeah. And then just but that, uh, straight that's, down. That's how they tell a story. I'm not yeah. talking about storytelling. I'm talking about the physical process, sitting down and charting something A, B, C, D, E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it finished before you actually draw anything. Yeah. You, you wouldn't well, do that. I, I, well, you wouldn't I wouldn't say I wouldn't do it. I've definitely, no, I've done it. I've done it. I've definitely done it. I've done it on uh, on the Future Shock thing I did for 2008. I sat down and wrote it, but that's because an editor had to read the story. Yeah. I, but, but I've also written stories where I have drawn the things out as I've been writing where I write down the dialogue and I know what's going to happen in it. So I, I kind of draw out the story, but like for me, if I'm writing anything, it starts with an idea and it starts with me thinking about it. And sometimes it'll, it'll be me sitting in a car, you know, if I'm doing a long drive for an hour. So thinking the entire plot, telling myself the story from beginning to end and how that would work. And, and then the, and then if I want to sit down and type it up, then that's, you know that you can call that writing. Um, I just call that. I I just call that typing up. But I mean, I'm not saying that there isn't a thought process when you. I'm, I'm saying I think in words. So I'm thinking in words. I'm not thinking in pictures. I'm thinking in words. And that is, if I were to sit and write it up, I'd be writing those words I've already got in my head. You know, it would not be a big change from that. But everyone's going to work differently. I mean, I'm not. You know, I'm not in any way going to dismiss anyone else's creative process oh, yeah. well, because we all work differently. What I find is that people who just go um, starting at A, page one, Superman final of the city, panel one, then they go panel two, Superman does this, page two, panel one. That's very, it's just a plot, you know, it's not about anything, you know. They, yeah, they, they, but I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying that at all. That's not what I'm saying. No, but I, I'm I saying people that. who don't plot the whole thing out, who don't understand uh -huh. that you're writing about one thing, Penguins, but it's actually about something else you know yeah yeah it's, no it's, it's not i mean i i so to, to we were clear i was talking about the physical process right so i was talking about the physical process of writing which is the physical you know idea think of your idea think of your story work out your plot work out your characters work, work, and then tighten it up and then hand that so that's the physical process the actual way of writing for me is to think you know it might start with a conceit it might start with an idea it might start with something super simple like what if like for example i'm writing a little short story at the moment and it's what you know what if that bit in star wars you know where they land on the the asteroid and the asteroid has all these creatures on it and the asteroid itself turns out to be a creature what if that was intentional what if they deliberately landed there because they wanted to capture the keep the creature you know so there's a little idea that's a nugget of an idea so then you start thinking about it. You think about your characters and what is this character going to do? And why why does that have an importance to that character? And why is this? So I am thinking, of, and I, I do, as I'm telling myself a story, once I've figured out um, what it's about and the plot of it, then I'll start looking for themes and I'll start thinking about thematically why this is important. Is this, 
you know, is their character going to betray another character or, and why would they do that? And so on. So I am thinking about all of those things. It's just a question of, do I plot these things out? I'd say to you as well, like most of the things I've, I've written and drawn are very, very short. Like they're short things. So they don't necessarily, I can keep them all in my head. They're not like 98 pages long. I mean, these are short six page stories that are relatively easy to keep in my head. Plus I think in page turns. So for me, it's like, what's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? What's going to happen here? And how do I get from there, there, and there, and there? Like, for example, so the, the short story I wrote for 2000 AD is called Roots. Um, and it is about a uh, kid who whose father has died. Uh, he leaves home because he's addicted to drugs, breaks back into the house. And then over the course of him being missing from the home, the, uh, the mother's been feeding this kind of weird black ichor to uh, the plants. And the plants have overgrown and become sort of alive. When he breaks in, the plants kind of take over his body, right? So that's the plot. That's the plot. What it's about is, you know, can can you love a child too much? Can you can you think that you're doing the best for them by kind of smothering them with your love? Because at the end, like the, the start of it, he runs out of the house saying something like, she's obsessed with her plants, and he runs out of the house saying, you can't prove me like I'm one of your plants. I am not. I have my own mind, I'm my own person, and he runs away. And then when he breaks in and he attempts to steal some money to, to buy more drugs, the plants grab his body, take over his body, and the last panel is literally her pruning the plants. And you're left with a kind of, you know, it's you, it's about something. It's, you know, it's not necessarily delivering that kind of big message or anything, but it's about something. Now, I plotted that in my head without writing it. So, you know, but it had to be written down for the editor to read it. You know, I, I wasn't going to draw the thing from, from scratch. It had to be written down. Uh, but most of my most, of my, and I think, like, I do think of characters and I think of theme um, and, you know, and, and I will kind of, I will plot out a whole thing. I will figure out a whole story. And then afterwards, I'll kind of go on over it and retelling it in my own head. I will think, no, thematically, maybe this would be, if we did this and did that and did this, then that would be. So the process of writing, I mean, that you can call all of that the process of writing if you want. I have no problem with that. I am just saying that for a lot of people, when they think of it, like when people go, oh, I could do this without writing, what they mean is I could do this without typing it on a piece of paper. That, But they think they think they, that that is the writing part of it, but that's not the writing part of it. The writing part of it is thinking of the thing and plotting the thing out and 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 the typing the words into a computer screen is largely a mechanical process for for some writers i mean other writers will work it out on a page as they're going but for some writers that's a mechanical process so whenever you know if, like but the stories that i've written in that little short story thing are largely i wouldn't say they're all pieces of fluff some of them have an awful lot of like the, there's one about my mom which i think jim's read have you read the one about my mom yeah yeah which have mm -hmm. you know which i think hit very hard um yeah. despite being very short and but they're not about plot they're about character they're entirely about character um but that was literally me writing my feelings down on the page as i was drawing the thing on the page so there was no writing involved so i would struggle to say to you i wrote that i would go to you no i did that i made that but that is a thing i made i wouldn't say i wrote it because i didn't it was literally done as i as i was going through it and then there's there's a couple of one page things that are kind of um, you know, me going, how can I tell a story that lasts for a thousand years in a single page? How can I tell a deep, dark story? How can I make this about something that's only one page long? And there's only so much you can do in one page. Like, you can't, but I think of these things through. And then when I've thought of them, then I'll draw them. I mean, and again, I could type it up first, but it wouldn't change a single word of what's on the page. That's just the mechanical process for me. So I, do, I think yeah. writing is very important. I don't think typing is that important. That sounds like a better answer. Yeah, um, the, the typing part of it is nuts and bolts. Put an IKEA yeah. thing together. Like, yeah. What you've got to spend is months. For me, it's months and months and months of putting the character together. I always have an mm. A story and a B story going together. Although the latest one, we threw away the B story because uh, we couldn't do it in color. Couldn't mm. do it in black and white. But take like four times as pages so the bigger story you have mm. to go but mm. i spend months on these things before yeah. i sit down and type anything but all that 
as far as I'm concerned, all the research, everything, that's all writing. That's all part mm. of it, you know. But I will that's write... all, I mean all of that all of that's the process towards writing a story. Yeah. And I think it's essential. I think I think that is all essential. All of that thinking about it's absolutely essential. You know, I do, but and the idea that anyone can produce any piece of comic art without having gone through some sort of process like that is absurd. It doesn't make any sense. All you'd end up with is some scribbles on a page. I've seen some. I was impressed by something a guy had on his web page at a convention. Mm -hmm. I bought his comic um, at the end of the second day, took it home, and oh my god. And I should I should have known because he said he had problems with the artists. When you hear that, warning bells go off, you know. Mm. I'm not so sure the artist was the problem in this case. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's a yeah. thing. But this thing had problems. Yeah. Um, it's I mean it's difficult because it's all it's very, very easy to help an artist. In, in my view, it's very easy if you see an artist walk in and say, Can you can you improve my storytelling? It's so easy. It is so because I can lift, look at a page of art and go, here's how I would make this better. Um, whereas with writing, it's a much more difficult process and, you, and there's no easy fix for it. There's no, let me read three pages of this and I'll tell you, you know, you've got to read all of it. You've got to digest all of it before you can give any kind of useful input into it. Um, I mean, I get, it's easy enough to go, look, if you're going to write a comic, make sure you don't have too much dialogue make sure you do these kind of things, establish the shots and so on so that the reader knows where they are and so on but like i can't you know i, I without sitting down and reading a 60 page graphic novel i can't in any way offer any sort of improvement on the 60 page that isn't either super generic or super generic but useful like think about your themes and think about your characters and give everyone a nice arc and you know use um dan Harmon's story circle to complete the story circle and make sure you've got characters that have that are fulfilled all the way around, you know, give everyone a want and a desire and make sure they're all doing, you know, super generic things that are good and useful, but also at the same time, they're not immediate. There's nothing I can do. Like, oh, you've, you've written and drawn, brilliant, that's great, but I can't tell you. On the other hand, someone hands me one page of comics, I can improve that, in, you know, instantly. It's like, oh, here's how you make this a little bit better, you know. Not always. Some pages are unimprovable. Ask, Jim's often doing that. I can't, there's nothing I can help with there he's he's completely you know uh on his own but I, like and actually genuinely i think any artist any artist uh, no matter what level can improve whatever it is they've drawn like every page i've ever drawn if i were to draw it again it would be a bit better you know not loads better but a little bit which means nothing is unimprovable from my artwork um but you know but artwork is easy to do that's always been the case it's always been easy to look at art because you can take it in visual stuff you take in so instantly so quickly whereas with the storytelling you really have to live and breathe with it a bit you know the only person that can do that is, is the writer really and then readers afterwards but by the time a reader gets to the thing uh there's nothing they can say that a writer with a bit of luck hasn't already thought of you know mm. um, so, uh, from my uh, when the message i was getting from both of you is no matter the method there's no avoiding the work you've got to sit down and you know it's a it's a tough and uh, um business and there's kind of see i remember being um at the very very outset going you know you want to break runes i break runes and everything and sometimes runes are runes for a reason you know you've got to sit down and do the work sit down and you know as ray you were saying plot it out and <clears throat> even do if your method isn't on the written page like that if it's in your mind and everything you can't eventually you, you can't avoid it or shortcut it uh, i think you've got to sit down and do the work and there's no avoiding it like it's especially you're looking for, like you were always looking um as artists to you know anything that will make work on your speed like save you time and you know speed to get mm. further along uh do more per more and more efficiently and so on but there's still no avoid. That doesn't mean that you can avoid doing the work. You've got to sit down and do the work. And that's what you were saying there, Ray, about um, plotting it down. It's really important. It's really, really important. Even the stories that Paul was saying, you know, mentioning this, that he, you, Paul, plotted it in your brain. You had it plotted. Now, eventually, when it, to get it to the editor, you had, you know, there's no avoiding it. You've got to present it in some form that the editor. Yeah, I mean, look. I, I do two kinds of stories generally so far in my experience. One is sort of plot driven, 
where I kind of think of a plot and then I kind of apply characters to it. And then I'm sort of looking for themes and not out of it. That the other one's character driven, but the character driven piece is what I find are almost always anecdotes or stories that are true. They're me telling a story from my perspective. So I am the character in that. And I can write those things like duck or, you know, like water off a duck because I am the character. I'm playing myself essentially. Even the sillier ones where um, I did a four page uh, detective comic, which is, just silly, just very silly about a giraffe. Um, and But it was still me as a character in, in that story. And it's still, um, so yeah, it's, but, you know, longer pieces I can't speak to because I've never really done them, you know. But I, I will say though, I, I mean, lately I've been thinking more, I've, there's a couple of stories written with the same cast of characters. And the first thing I wrote with them was written specifically because I thought, well, if I, wa- if I want to write something with these characters longer, it would be a good idea to have a, conversation with them to write something where they're in a locked room having a conversation with each other so I can tell how they will react to each other and how they will you know talk to each other and how I might think of that yeah. and that 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 was that's been interesting because it's meant that when I have like half an inkling for a plot it, the rest of it sort of fills it in because I know those characters well now it's like yeah. well, I know what they would do in that situation I know that would be funny or not funny you know. Can I ask Ray? You, whenever you met Paul, um, was that that a course? Uh, was it strictly writing comics, or was it writing and drawing comics? Or what was um, it? I think it was the spaghetti method of writing, right? Where you give me five men's names, throw them at the wall, two sticks. Give me yeah. five women's names, throw them at the wall, and give me a setting, a time period, a genre. And then mix and match and like a, a shortcut to get the, the people who are on the course because they all wanted to write the bible as a comic book yeah all we're trying to get them to just do four little pages and that means quick 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 who's in it what are they doing where are they and why are they doing it you know that kind of way yeah. um i i felt a bit of a fraud doing that course because i i, I think it was advertised as creating comics and it wasn't i think you know? Now I say that now, it was great at the time. I used to go there for two hours and it felt like 20 minutes every week. And my mm. favorite night was a night we inked pages of Judge Dredd. Yeah. I just found that yeah. fantastic. It was so... Well, the, oh. the way I treated it was, I can't, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know, I, you don't know who's going to come. So you don't know if you're going to have artists and writers and, and whatever. Um, there's a limit to how much you can do in, in so many days. So I felt like the way I would I should do it is to kind of go with a here's everything you can do in comics and it's up to you to pick and choose after this which direction you want to go in. So here's every stage of the process of making a comic book from beginning through the middle to the end. So here, week one was let's come up with an idea. Week two was, you know, how do you script that? And I couldn't, you know, I think I was quite good at coming up with silly ideas on, on the spot that were plot driven. Um, but they were, I was kind of basically pushing towards future shocks, um, more than any other kind of story. Um, cause I, you know, I can, I can speak to those better than I can speak to other things. Uh, and, and I, it's also, again, I, you know, you're sort of trying to show people a direction of travel and not give them an absolute mandate of here's what you have to do to be a writer. It's like, look, these are all the areas you can go into, whatever you want to do, but I'm going to show you this. So it was kind of also showing people what a script looked like because I didn't know how many people even had seen a script before. And also the correct way, not the correct way, but my preferred way to see a script. And as a working artist, I could tell you what scripts should look like from my perspective. And I think that was a valuable, that's a pretty valuable thing because, you know, so many writers write thinking, I don't know what an artist is going to need. So I'm going to write everything in this. And they've written kind of not a great script for an artist to work from because you're communicating with someone else. So it was kind of, it was, let's try every, let's do everything. And we, we did do inking as well, which I'm kind of surprised you enjoyed as much because I thought it was, this was me ga- grasping at straws for <laughs> things to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it, I, I was quite happy with the course work and the, and the kind of things that we did. Um, again, it was always difficult because I did that course twice. And the second time I had a different mix of people and they liked different things. So it's sort of, you know, you're kind of, it's hard to do. And I think that later on, there was other people doing the course. Um, like, like but, I said before to, to Jim, it was very much from the artist's point of view, a lot of it. Uh, because yeah, you're artist, yeah. right? First and foremost. Yeah. 
very little to do with how much anything costs or how you get things you know to print um, and yeah. there were valuable things you threw out as anecdotes that i found very helpful every week uh, it is yeah. like you said different people show up and they need different things and yeah. it's just an open-ended thing making comics you could spend mm. five hours talking about one thing you know but i found the whole thing very enjoyable you know but the first night i went i'd had a bad experience in comics and i was packing it in and uh, you said to me, um, look, just forget about that. Give it a shot. And my wife had actually said, I paid for those that course. You're going. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you saying to me, look, forget about that. These things happen. Move on. Give it a shot. And mm. I went back each week and I enjoyed it more and more. By the time it was over, I missed it in you know, a kind of way. Yeah. They wanted to know more about comics. And there is so much more. The, yeah. It really, really is. It's, you could put everything about it into like six, two hours, you know, because yeah. there's just so much. When it gets nitty gritty, there's just so much involved in it. Yeah, the, the thing is, the thing is, and I, I think, I mean, um, without knowing exactly what those guys were thinking, I think yes. it, it, if, if you went to those things and you're getting inside story, inside information about, I mean, I was trying yeah. to. Exactly. To kind of give people a good slice of what the reality of working in comics is, as well as kind of going through all these different, I mean, I had tutorial plans and things we were going to do. And I think we mostly did those things. And I think they were useful. I think oh, yeah. they were all useful in their own way. Um, but I, very... I wouldn't knock it. I, I've, I've never yeah. said anything bad about the course. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Um, um, the tutor, he left a bit to be desired. But other than that, it was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's um, it's a, it's an odd. I mean, it was an odd course to do. But I, I do think like any time I have any sort of comic, comic course, I have to make the assumption. I know I do. I always make the assumption the people on this course know nothing at all about comics, or if they know anything about it, it's quite limited. And so, there's value in even just telling them the basics. Sometimes there's value in even telling them things like this is called saddle stitching, and this is perfect bind, and this is you know. These are these are the kind of these are useful things to know, you know. Um, plus, I, I thought it was very funny, but that that's just me. I, I I thoroughly enjoyed the whole thing, you know. And some of it I already knew, but other stuff. Um, yeah. Jonathan Ross giving me a Cintiq. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> no, other people had to buy their own, but but you could give them one. It was great. Yeah. No, I know. There's some yeah. weird things about comics. I'm going off the like I'm that. going off the Montenegro yeah. the next next month and. No, I'm not paying for it. <laughs> it's a it's a brilliant industry where you get odd things happening to you. I've always liked that about it. But I don't. The thing is, Ray, I, I would say I've definitely worked the trenches. Oh yeah. No one can say I didn't. Jim's known me while I was working the trenches. I, I have no. I, there was a weird thing. Um, because this is odd to me. This is really, really odd because you've also lucked into a lot of things. Like you'd say things. I remember the time you told me that Jonathan Ross story. I was like, what are you talking about? What? Well, let's, let's not go too much into that. because <laughs> No, but I'm just saying, it's, it's just one of those things. But I remember, see, for a long time, Paul was working in IT and he had that job. And I mean, for as long as, this is really weird. For as long as Paul, I knew Paul, in Paul's, um, I'm going to talk about you in the third person here. Um, Paul's okay. um, perception was he was doing these other things and comic was sort of on the periphery. Hmm. Maybe one day I'd like to, who knows, perhaps, but I've got this other stuff going on. That wasn't yeah. my perception at all. My perception was Paul is Mr. Comic Book from I was uh -huh. 12 or something. Like I always knew Paul was always there with drawing tables and comics and you know, and all of this, and I would look at his drawings and go, all right, okay, all right, all right, all right okay, well, what, what, and I would ask him questions, what about this and what about that? And then it seemed to me that for some reason he decided, well, this is going to be the year, I'm going to send some stuff off to, and my perception was um, you got together some drawings, sent them to the editors, and the editors sent you a script back and said, do you want to do that? Like, it was that Easy, not easy, but it was that um, straightforward. Like there didn't seem to you don't have five years worth of rejection letters 
Good luck, Kenzie. No, no, You'll I happen don't. Very and, quickly. And, yeah, I, I would say it happened very quickly. I think part of that might be because, and rightly or wrongly, part of that was me going, I'm not good enough yet. Just not good enough yet. And I keep doing it because I'm enjoying it. I'm just not good enough yet. Uh, and then I, I was doing um, from about 1997. So I was about 27. Well, 25 was the first time I ever got anything really published. And that was for Fantagraphics. Uh, Malcone had, had asked me to write a thing or to draw a thing. And I, I drew a thing for Fantagraphics. And that was published. And that was me kind of looking at it going, I can actually draw a comic. Um, and then I did a, a, another strip of his where I said to him, do you have a strip? And he gave me a, a comic strip. And I went, well, if I can do this in 30 days, I know I can draw comics. I can, like, if I can do it in the time frame, I can draw comics. Because I think part, part of maybe, um, I wasn't, I, I always wanted to draw comics, I think. Um, and I would talk about it. But I also love working in computers. I love both of these things equally. There is no... There's no two, two ways about it. I love computers and I love uh, comics, but computers paid me money from the age of 14. I was working on IT from the age of 14, paid quite good money. I was good enough to be earning money from that age in computers. At the age of 14 and drawn, I was probably slightly better than the average 14-year-old. Not, not significantly. I mean, there's a couple of guys in my class that were way better artists than I was. Um, but I wanted to draw comics. I didn't want to draw anything else. I just wanted to draw comics. So I kept drawing comics and uh, gave up for a while, came back to it for a while. And when I was about 25 or so, I was still, I was doing the other little small press thing, went back to university to study computers and, um, or 23. Um, and I did, um, so in 95, I did this thing with Mal. And I thought, this is it. This is, this is my career is about to take off because I don't think I was good enough for mainstream comics, but I was still doing stuff that was being published by Fantagraphics, which are slight, you know, um, you get away with more in terms of the finish of the artwork and, you know, the, the, the style of the artwork. It was much more forgiving uh, in what you were doing. And so I did that. I thought this is my career taking off. And I did a 80 page graphic novel and I did a 40 page comic and I got paid a total of $145. So that was never going to be, <laughs> that was never going to be the deal. Um, and I just wasn't, I just knew I wasn't good enough. I just knew I wasn't good enough. So I never sent things in. I think in 95, when the Dread movie came out, I sent some stuff to the uh, uh, Judge Dread Lawman of the Future because um, I thought, well, they're slightly cartoonier. So and I can get away with slightly cartoonier. And I got a, I think I got a rejection letter from them. I can't really remember, but I was definitely, definitely didn't get work from it. Uh, and then, 97 i kind of started deciding i wanted to do more 2008 kind of stuff did some stuff for a fanzine with a friend got to know gordon rennie who was working for 2008 at the time and i would ask gordon to send stuff to the, the editor so stuff was going to him but the editor was going that's rubbish why are you sending me this so it was not rejection letter after rejection letter it was not not being sent in it was going in by our writer because i thought that's a door already open for me. I'm working with this guy. He he can put this stuff in front of an editor. I I don't know if he did necessarily put the stuff in front of an editor. I know I know one time he told me, uh, why did you send me that? It's terrible. I, I think Ray's just fallen off his chair. Um, why did you send me that? That's terrible. I was talking to the editor and we both think it's shit. Um, so that, yeah, that was the that was the one time. And then whenever 2000, I went to the first Judge Dread comic convention and I had I had some artwork with me but by then I was kind of I was doing a lot of stuff in small press things and um, Jim and I have talked about this before I think we're there you reach a point in your small press career when you're at the kind of amateur level where you're in demand all the time because you're free and you do the work and the work's good and people are constantly asking you to do stuff and you realize that hey I could work forever now because I'm free and so you start putting a little value on that and a, a little more value and the value creeps up until you reach a point where you're going, I'm still busy, even though I'm charging this amount of money. So I must be good. I must be good enough. And I went to Andy Diggle with a, a pile of stuff. Andy Diggle, who's the editor of 2008 at the time, I, with a pile of stuff. And I said to him, look, I'm not good enough yet. But if you look at the artwork, you'll see it's definitely getting better. So all I, all I was really after was for him to go, look, I'll send you some scripts, send some samples in, and we'll see. That was t 
to me, that was going to be the start of a kind of, can I get better? Can I get better relationship? But Andy kind of went, no, I can see that. I'm, I'll give you some work. And, and then I, I kind of phoned Gordon and said, Andy said he's going to give me some work. And Gordon went, well, I've just sent a dread and I'll ask him if you can do it. And that, so it surprised me the, the speed that it went from nothing to that it was very much a surprise to me. But it wasn't like I wasn't doing anything. It wasn't like I lucked into it. It was definitely hard. Gra- Even knowing Gordon Rennie was a decision I made because four or five years prior to that, I'd been offered some small press stuff. And um, the editor at the time says, you can work for this writer, who I didn't know, or you can work with Gordon Rennie. I've got a script by Gordon Rennie. Gordon, who I did know was working for 2000 AD, and I went, I'll work with Gordon Rennie because why would you know? No harm to the other. It might be an amazing script, but Gordon Rennie is writing for Drudge Dread at the moment, so it would be stupid not to do that. And so that that was a decision that kind of carried me through. So they're not. It's. I don't think. I think there is a certain amount of luck to all of this stuff, but there's also a certain amount of making your own luck and being available for these things. Like, uh, like the first kind of significant work I had for 2008 was a Rogue Trooper strip, and I had. Prior to that, so I was doing stuff for 2000 AD and doing stuff for fanzines. I'd said to a friend of mine, Simon Spurrier, who would later go on to bigger, better things. Simon had yet to really break into 2000 AD. Uh, I said to him, Simon, I want to draw Rogue Trooper. Can you draw me a Rogue Trooper? Can you write me a Rogue Trooper story for a small press comic? And I will draw it. And then I'll use that as a sample for 2000 AD and say, look, this is what my Rogue Trooper would look like. And he went, yeah, sure, I can do. And so he wrote me a thing. I hadn't finished it yet. I'd drawn one page of it. And it was actually looking all right. I think my memory might be playing tricks on me. Um, and then he emailed me and said, look, I've sold, I've sold, I've slightly rewritten that story and I've sold it to the Warhammer uh, 40K comic. Do you, do you, are you okay with that? I went, yeah, no, God, no, make some money on it, for God's sake. But by then I'd already done some stuff with Warhammer. Um and he said to me, well, I'll ask him if you can draw that. And so I got drawn it. And after I'd drawn it, I was shown this. To, and it was very war, Rogue Trooper. It was very Rogue Trooper-like. And I showed it to uh, Rob Williams. And we were at a convention. And at this point, Andy had moved on. And it was Matt Smith was now the editor. And I, I said, oh, I don't know. Because the, the difficulty in your career is you get to work for 2000 a year, who, whatever publisher it is. So and you've done that first thing. And it's how do you how do you approach them for the next thing? How do you get the next thing, the third thing, and the fourth thing? Those things are difficult. Those steps are difficult because nobody talks about them. Everyone talks about getting your foot in the door. Nobody talks about how do you keep that door jimmied open long enough for you to long enough for you to not be noticed anymore. And now you're part of the furniture. How do you do that? Um, and so that's that's a harder trick. But um, I'd shown this stuff to Rob Williams, and it was grey wash, and it was very Rogue Trooper like. And he said, "Why don't you just show that to Matt? Just show him." Like, and I'm going, oh, I don't want to show him it. I don't think it's good enough. So Stan, go up and show him it. It's good enough to show him it. So I showed it to Matt, um, and he liked it. And uh, I was on honeymoon in Barbados, and I got an email from Matt uh, in Barbados that said, hey, do you want to draw a six-part road trooper to, from that sample? So again, is you know, how much of that is luck and how much of that is manufactured? You know, mm. and, and yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's not... I wouldn't say there's no luck involved. I absolutely wouldn't say that. Opportunities are, you know, part of it is about being able to um, utilize those those opportunities and being able to kind of um, empower them and being ready for them when they when they raise themselves. And part of it's about manufacturing those opportunities. Part of it's about kind of you know how do you how do you excite up the editors or whatever job it is that you want. And also, and I'll be completely honest, I've said this about other other people as well. It's like part of it is what do you want? Like what is what is your real goal? What is, where is your goal at? What is your what is this height of the ceiling of your ambition? Where is that at? And you know, what happens when you hit it? Like what do you do then? And for me, for a long time, my ceiling was judged. I wanted to draw Judge Dredd. So the moment I got drawn Judge Dredd, I was at a bit of a loss. For a long, long time, I didn't know where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do. Um, it took me quite some time to kind of figure that out. I'm still, I mean, I'm still struggling with it a bit. Still, kind of, you know, sometimes it does feel like a bit like you're a little bit of rule about kind of drawing stuff because somebody's asked you and you've got bills to pay and you kind of go, well, I've got to work to eat. Uh, and then sometimes you're kind of going, oh no, this is the sort of thing I really want to do. If I get to do this all the time, this would be great, you know. 
Um, so and I'm, I'm doing a gig at the moment. I just started um, where I had no work on. And there was a gap coming up and I posted on Twitter saying, I've got no work on. Does anyone need a comic artist? And they want to pay me. And that I got this gig from that tweet. Now, you could argue there's luck involved in that. You could argue that that was me making an opportunity that didn't exist, you know. Um, and I know, and I know, like a good friend of mine, professional, has kind of gone. I don't think you should post stuff like that because it makes it look very like you're kind of a bit sort of, you know, just just not a good sign. It's just not a good vibe to, to throw out there. But at the same time, it's bought a gig which might be quite significant for me over the next, you know, number of years, maybe. You know, or it might not. I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. Anyway, there you go. I told you I could talk for a long time, Joe. I said to you, one hour is not going to do it. <laughs> well, you told me you had a thing to do. You said you had a thing to do, something to do. I know, no, I, I got called off. I got called oh, off. Okay. So. Oh, right. okay. Um, You've got me till like midnight if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> um, I was trying to think, I was going to ask something. Uh, I think I've run out of questions, probably. I don't take any right. So I'm always worried that Ray is a very sensible man who's lived a very sensible life and has made very sensible decisions and looks at me and thinks, PJ is an idiot and a fool. And I think to myself, oh no, I've made Ray think I'm an idiot again. But I'm, I'm not. I promise yeah. you, I'm not. <laughs> if you read any of our stuff, I am not the sensible person you think I am. <laughs> I do have a list of Talk. questions. And the first thing it says, uh, do not ask about Judge Dredd. We only have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sorry about that. Most of it was advice for young artists, things like that. How important is it to go to cons and be there, you know, show yourself, that kind of thing. That's what most of the questions are going to be anyway. I, I would say I, I, there, are two, there, there are two things that are super important about conventions. One is that um, one is getting to know other people. One is getting to know your peers, right? Like, so for example, um, my peers, whenever I came into comics as as a as a comic artist, were the people I was seeing at conventions and on a regular basis that would appear in the same conventions as me are people like Al Ewing and Simon Spurrier and Rob Williams and Jock, and those people are, are all you know they've all had great careers. I mean, they then go on to have good careers. So that that's the first thing you 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 know that whole you know. You know you should go and network or not network. I hate networking or I love networking, whatever it is. That's don't think about networking. Think about meeting other people who are into the same thing you're into. You know, thinking about meeting people who are at the same level as you doing the same thing. Those are your peers. Those are the people that you'll be able to kind of rely on. You could be these could be friends for the next 30 or 40 years. You know, the, these these are enduring friendships that you're going to build. So that's the first reason. That's, that's the first reason a good go cons. Because it's, I mean, what are the odds that in Northern Ireland, for example, um, you're going to meet 100 people into comics? They're not, you're not going to bump into them, you know. You, you've got to go to a convention. That's that's where they're going to be. Uh, that will attract those kinds of people. And the people that want to make comics are going to be in conventions. Unless you're very lucky and happen to have a friend who's into it, you're not going to meet other people like that. And the other reason you go to conventions is so people get to know who you are. People get to know what you do. People get to know the work that you're producing, and and so that they, you know, if they see you um, multiple times, if you go to a convention and meet an editor, if you're a writer and you meet an editor once and you just say hello, uh, I'm here to say hello. That's great. You see them again at a convention and you go, hey, we met last year. Do you remember? And I've done this book. And they go, oh, that's great. Oh, that's brilliant. That's good to hear. You meet them another year. You go, I've done this graphic novel. And they go, oh, that's brilliant, fantastic. And you meet them a third year. They go. Oh yeah, do you, I read that graphic novel of yours. Do you want to do you want to go for uh, a drink and we'll have a chat about maybe something? Do you have any ideas to pitch? That's how it works. That's how it works for writers. You know, um, it's a longer road because the for an artist it's very easy to go. Here's my artwork. What do you think, editor? And the editor to go, that's amazing. You're hired. Never happens like that. But that's that's the that's the dream. With a writer, it's much more. It's about building relationships with the editors. It's about sort of them getting to know you as well as you getting to know who's who and what's what and so on. So conventions are great. They're also good for the soul. I think it's also really important to kind of, to break out of the little box you build for yourself, the safety box of, of doing your own work and to go into a convention and finding out, um, finding out your place in comics, find out where you might think you sit in a certain area and then you go out to a convention and you realize, oh no, I'm, no, that's, other people have a different view of me and that's interesting. 
you know, like Jim, I think Jim would do it really, you go to a convention gym uh, with Ray and you sit there and you will suddenly find uh, an experience that might be overwhelming, might be wonderful, and but it'll definitely be different from what you're expecting, you know, because at the moment, I don't think you've done any conventions yet, really, have you? Uh, uh, no, no, I haven't. I haven't done it. Well, yeah. I did. I did um, uh, QCon in Queens, and yeah, right that's me, there was a bloody wrestling match in the middle of the the. That's um, a different. Uh, like QCon's a different beast. But I like once you've got work out there, when you see people coming up and picking up that book, and people know you, know your name, know your artwork, and and say to you, "I really liked whenever you did that." It will come as a surprise. I mean, it did to me. Yeah. It does. Like even now, I like the the most name clangy thing I'm, i'll do this because i'm a horrible person i when i was in new york uh, dave gibbons came over to my table that i was at and i thought oh my god there's dave gibbons he goes well pj how are you I go, oh my god dave gibbons is talking to me like i'm a normal person like he knows me and it's like yeah we you know we've chatted a few times over the years and we've got to the, you know and so you and the the reality of that is kind of odd and, and it's yeah. just it's lovely it's nice it's a really nice thing to find out that people like your work and you don't find that out until you see them you know that's a really nice experience but yeah i mean at the start of your career you want to go to conventions because it's just good to know the lay of the land it's good to know what's yeah. going on and yeah. all, all the way out there and it's good to make friends and i mean the first conventions i went to i went um with a guy called um uh, Stuart perkins Stuart croft perkins who was the editor of a 2000 ev fanzine I didn't know anything about England. I hadn't really been over to England before. And Stuart was from England, ex-army. He would turn up at a convention like you know hours early and march around the place and get the lay of the land and know where everything is. And whenever I flew over and meet him, we'd share a, a, a hotel together. He would go, let's go down to the coffee place. Let's go down to the convention halls down here. Let's go there. And I, it was like, you know, it's like having a big brother that knew everything that was going on. It was great. And these are, you know, these are the people you meet at shows, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Do shows, Jim. You've got to go to a show. No, no, definitely, definitely. Whenever uh, we get these two books, we're, there's one we're working on, Wolf, and um, we're going to finish off SSDD. And I kind of, uh, I want to get those finished complete in the bag. And then definitely we've got to push, push, push push those two books because um i think it'd be really something special and really and uh, my mind it's hard you know whenever i get a i get a, a focus on something i haven't mm. uh, looked at anything else i'm not like having the energy to think about anything else is these two books are going to occupy me at least for the, the next few months anyway and and then um i'll kind of wipe the gauze off my eyes and look around and see what's happening but yeah definitely no no we've got to um do a, a convention the two pugs um convention uh we've got to do that but yeah i'm just kind of laser focused on these two books and apart from anything as i keep saying this to ray that i'm a fan and i want to read it i want to see it finish mm. and, and, and i want to see it do you want to should we finish off really quickly on the only i think it's only um fight i think you and i've ever come close to having i don't mean physical fight i mean you know verbal and it's the only time I've saw I've, I've ever seen Paul ever like go off on me. Like he went off on me. Some... <laughs> me? Do you remember this? I, I mean, you make me sound like a person prone to rants, and I think as we no, all no, witnessed no, this, no, past, no. this past two hours, that's not something that I am. Yeah. It's, it's, no, it's it's so unusual um, that you got. I, I thought, oh, hang on a minute, he's he's proper cross, and I did it. I made I made you do it. I made it cross, but it's a funny story anyway. Because it's it's weird. It's one of those stories where um, well, two people are saying the same thing, or they're on the same, or they agree with each other, but for some reason they're shouting at each other. I, yeah, I, I don't know yeah. if you remember this. I had this thing about I'm a, I'm, I'm a huge fan of 2000 AD and of Judge Dredd, and uh, uh, I really really love it. But I, I just observed a thing that bothered me about Judge Dredd and and Mega City and Judge Dredd's world. And I was expressing this to Paul one day and he went off on one <laughs> because okay. of your devotion to the character. Um and you were oh, sorry, like me, it. but okay, go on, go on, go on. No, you were having none of it. You were like and I think it's the only time you ever like you proper you were properly cross. You were like you were just no gem, you're like this is it. And you never did that. You never enough foreplay, tell sense. me what it is. Huh? 
enough foreplay. Tell me what it is. <laughs> so I said that in my perception of dread and of mega city and everything was there was too much there was so much corruption and chaos and explosion and extreme and violence that it's not shocking judge judge dread's appearance and everything is lost amongst all like if everybody's corrupt there's no hmm. corruption really because there's and so what i thought was maybe you should have a an absolutely pure fascistic aesthetic straight angles absolutely clean streets no cry no no visible outward experience or appearance of crime no uh extreme violence so that whenever it does happen whenever there is an explosion of violence or whenever they it's really shocking because at the mm -hmm. minute whenever you see judge dread it's decaying it's falling down it's people with guns kids with guns dogs with guns monkeys with guns you know there's this chaos chaotic energy and and so to me it's less shocking then there's a bomb or something goes off and um that's less shocking whereas it was all clean lines you know straight buildings everybody and i because i wanted to i wanted to draw the citizens of mega city one in um um like lycra lycra skin suits mm -hmm. all with a barcode on this on the side that mm -hmm. everybody had the same lycra skin suits like what do you call those um yeah, I, think uh, one, I mean one of one of the things with dreads world to me is that it is all encompassing it is yes. it's got everything in it and so I even like for example like lycra skin suits with with there there is a there's a ron smith com a ron smith judge dread um few issues where uh, there are people dressed exactly like as you described in fact their faces have they've erased their faces so all their faces are two little blobs for eyes and a little blob for a mouth and those yeah. people are part of a cult and yeah. um that 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 world you know those exist there's also max normal who is the pinstripe freak he's so called because he wears a pinstripe suit which he looks so normal by contrast to everything else weird in mega city one that he is completely uh, you know like insane looking because yeah. he's so normal and so those things like Dreads World is not a monolith. There's no kind of everything in Dreads World is X or everything in Dreads World is Y. It is. It has got the beauty of it. I think is that it's got all of that stuff. It's all in that one big pot. There are uh, judges that are so utterly devoted to the law, like Dread, that like a typo in the law manual, they go off and shoot you. You know that that's that's how devoted to the law they are. And then there are judges that are so utterly corrupt, you kind of wonder, how do they even exist in the same comic? But that's sort of the nature of a comic written and drawn by multiple people over, you know, 47 years. It's, you know, it would be impossible. So the idea of a monolithic, it absolutely wouldn't, to me, if you were going to write a story with that kind of aesthetic, it would, it would, it would work. It would just not be all of Mega City One. It would be one area in Mega City One. It would yeah. be one part of Dread's world that you could easily go. This is an area we've never seen before because it's so big. The place is yeah. so big. It's all of the Eastern Seaboard. So we've just never seen this block and these people. And now Dread stumbled into it. So you're like Dread is always, uh, you know, lots of Dread stories are essentially here's the story I want to tell, and now Dread's come into it, and Dread is the catalyst for change. Or, or, or whatever it is so it's a kind of it's a world so perfect i mean for example a, a block and a, a set of blocks so perfectly structured so absolutely unchaotic in every form that they are perfect dread gets assigned to look after that to patrol that block one citizen does something by accident dread's introduction to that city introduces chaos and as he leaves everything now is back to exactly the same as mega city one and dread thinks that's much better you know uh, yeah. even though it's no longer ordered you know it's it's kind of it's it's you know it's it's an interesting idea for a single story i don't think i don't i mean it, purely in terms of um logistics you couldn't make that work in dreads world because there's too many writers and artists involved yeah. in it yeah. in terms of a single story you could make it work in terms of me being angry about it i don't know what you must have, you might mu you must have just got my hackles up that day <laughs> i think well we talked about it quite a bit and it got a bit hazy and I, I was kind of going, no, what I'm trying to say is like, but I think you, you were right uh, in reflection because what, it, what as you say, there's lots of other writers, you know, you can sustain that. And also it's sort of like, 
I don't know if you said a, a story in a Charlene temple, but you know, all the Charlene monks had chef's hats on. You'd go, well, what is this? It's a, mm. it's not, you know, it's a Charlene temple. It's too temple. contrary. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be like, what, what, they're, why are there chefs in there? It's, it's too, yeah. so dreads. But I mean, the, is the thing is, the it. thing is, you could do something like that with Batman. You could go, right, this is what Batman's world is like now because Batman gets reset every so often. Dread yeah. doesn't get reset. And because yeah. by the nature of it not getting reset, it means if you did come in and say, here's what I want Mega City One to look like, the writer, editor might go, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. But you can't, no, you can't just ignore the fact that up until that point, that world has been chaotic. You'd have to explain why it's now ordered and perfect and you know neutral or whatever, and and um and then introduce the chaos to it. But again, it's the sort of thing that would it's a conceit that I think would work for a story. I you know, but I don't think it stains itself over any length of time. It's just it's it's yeah. too you know it, it's it, you need you need to kind of you're constantly I think in dread stories constantly uh, showing order and then chaos and then dread as a catalyst coming in and and upsetting the chaos but in a completely different way you know oh, I almost think every what, what, you're like saying that. That I, what i was saying i think this is where i got you where i kind of uh, whoa hang on a minute because and i think this is i think again i think that you were right um because what i was saying was dread was the status quo he yeah. wasn't you know i'm the law he's this, he's not the law he's the status quo because he sets everything you know there's this chaos and you know and then something will happen and he'll reset that to the status quo Again, yeah, and I think that's what I said, and kind of, but it was just one of those things. Two, two mates talking, and actually, I think we were mostly in agreement. But it was one Jim. Of those days. I mean, look, I this is the thing that um I have pointed out to my wife a lot about our relationship. I like getting arguing with you. I it's a good it's good fun. It's I mean because they are ultimately none of these arguments have any stakes whatsoever. Um. <laughs> <laughs> they are the lowest of stakes of arguments. Yeah. Um, they are just have uh, no consequences. They are unimportant in the wider scheme of things. They matter not a jot. And by tomorrow, we'll have forgotten about them. That's, but you know, that's, that's the, the fun. people who are into comic books and and nerds and everything uh, will argue. Read. I remember this, a guy telling me uh, 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 something about the Hulk, and man, he was into the Hulk, and he was <laughs> like, and I, I was just, I was, you know, I whatever. Uh, but he no, he was into it and you know so passionate and really angry. Ray, you must know that somebody is going to say about Bo or Sam or somebody um, Harold or something like this. I'd say no, Bo would never do that. Bo would never say whatever it is. Bo would only ever do. Well, Sam um, is based on a real person, so a lot of people have said she's not like that. Or she wouldn't do that. She you know, would. people I work with. They all say, oh, you got that wrong. You got but that wrong. She's an interpretation of how I see this person. Yeah. If I take away all accountability, she can say what she likes, do what she likes. They're taking but how would that person. blow your mind, Ray, that you think somebody, someone somewhere, there's going to be two dudes arguing about whether or not Bo or Sam might do this or that, or, you know, that as yeah, one yeah. of your creations, like somebody you created. Hopefully. So somebody's going to say, nah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully two people are sitting somewhere looking daggers at each other. <laughs> going, you're dead to me now. You don't like such a thing. Yeah, it'd be great if it was. Um, but I take criticism about the comics in my stride because they're not me. They're something I've made, you know. You've got to, yeah. Other things I take per very personally. But the comics, you can have an opinion. You can say, I don't like that. Fine. Yeah. It's bad. But um, we are getting people more and more coming up to us and saying, the talking gun. Is that a prequel to The Walking Dead? <laughs> say yes. Say, but... No, it's not. <laughs> don't be rude about it. No, it's not. You know? just, just, just say, say well, you've got why to, don't you buy, buy it and buy find it. out yourself? Yeah. <laughs> it is the thing. I have no poker face. My, whatever I'm thinking is right there. And I find it very difficult walking up to a table and talking to people. Um, because I'm thinking, oh, I don't agree with this. I don't like this, you know. And it gets me into all kinds of trouble. Yeah. I find it very difficult meeting people in person and finding the middle ground because it's always like it's not quite Christmas Day in the trenches where they have game football lads. You know, it's it's never like that with me and people. It's always I like your Ray, I hate your Ray. It's never middle of the road Ray. You know, 
That's good though. That's the same with comics. People hate them. They love them. You know, it's the ones that are blah. You know, I I see a lot of comics out there that I wouldn't bother picking up because they're formulaic. They everything happens on page two, page six, page twelve. Similar things because they've been taught to tell a story that way. And it's assembly line. But I shocked PJ one night by saying, I've never read 2080 or George Dread. And he goes, What? <laughs> I was like, Yeah, no, well, I hope I hope that's right. since been rectified. But I did say to him, like, I did see the Stallone movie, and he went, Oh, we don't talk about that. <laughs> I, d- I hope you've rectified that. There are some great, you don't have to read yeah. all of it, obviously, but there's some brilliant things out there. Yeah. Halo Jones, uh, anything by Alan Moore is good. Um, but, well, okay, well, you know, you're missing out, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. Anyway, look, guys, I'm going to have to go because it's getting late. My son, I'm sharing a room with my son. This is my studio space now, but it's also his bedroom, and he wants to go to bed at some point, so <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna exit. exit. Okay, uh, I have you on. I can't yeah, remember anything we talked about, but I'll look it back over and see what it was. And we uh, hope to have you on again some other time. You yeah, can tell thanks us about Paul, um, or whatever. Uh, you know, did, did you get to see me drawing anything? I don't really know what, what oh, you yeah. ever saw. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. That guy with the red helmet. That guy. Yeah, your man. Batman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, then. Good see you all. Been a pleasure. Bye. God bless. Bye. Bye.